there is one great unsolved mystery that human beings have been grappling with since around the time of the Enlightenment all the way up to today. And I believe they'll continue to struggle with unless they drastically change their way of looking at the world. It was only after or around the time of the Enlightenment when human beings started to move away from God, from the Creator, that they started to lose track of who they are, what their true nature is, why they exist, who are we, why am I here, what am I? These questions are real questions but that have no answers in the absence of God. And what's very interesting is that the Enlightenment is known as the Enlightenment, the period of you know, illumination, where human beings you know, supposedly move away uh, from the tyranny and oppression of religion, Christianity to be more specific, and turn away from binding and controlling ideas such as that of God. Uh, and they supposedly are moving towards an enlightened age where they are no longer restricted by these things, these quote-unquote superstitions. But funnily enough, as soon as they turned away from God, they started to fall into this problem. They realized that they, they can't now make sense of themselves. A brilliant example of this <clears throat> we find in David Hume, an 18th century philosopher, empiricist. Uh, he suffered from melancholy, from depression. And he wrote about this extensively too. And he, you know, highlighted that again from his empiricist perspective, from a purely naturalistic perspective, what are we as human beings? And according to him, we were no more than just a bunch of a set of perceptions, atoms and molecules in motion. There's nothing solid, nothing that was weighty and unchanging about us, our nature. And this caused him a lot of distress. It caused him a lot of anxiety, a lot of trouble. And his escape from this was in nature. He referred to, he, he sort of mentions this as nature provides the solution, nature provides the escape. And what he meant by this was and where he found comfort was in through socialize, socializing, through spending time with friends, playing games, you know. Uh, and he, the idea was that, the, that we shouldn't even think about these things. Because when you think about man's nature and what are we and who we are and why we're here, this causes distress because there are no answers, obviously not, uh, in the absence of God. So what he said was, and according to him, was we should stop thinking about these things. We should just do what we desire to do and engage in social activity and things that please us and this will keep our minds off it and lead to happiness. Now, it's arguable you know, in regards to what type of happiness it leads to. And I would argue that it's a type of fleeting happiness which doesn't remain as soon as the activity is over, you're back to square one again. But he, this pushed him to even say that we should put our passions over reason. Because up to, you know, the predominant thinking at the time was for a very long time that human reason, our rational faculties are our defining feature, our most highest faculty. But Hume suggested, you know, that we should, uh, our passions, our emotions, our desires should be put above our reason. And this was the reason because he found that when he followed his passions and things that pleased him, it freed him from the pain and anxiety caused by thinking and reasoning about his very existence. But to contrast this, we had another individual, Alexander uh, Pope, a poet of one of the greatest, most eminent poets of the 18th century. And he too faced these very same questions, but he didn't, he couldn't just, uh, he couldn't just ignore uh, the reality of things as David Hume was or couldn't just escape it by just enjoying himself and fulfilling his passions and he writes extensively again from his perspective how he's left without answers in regards to these most fundamental questions we face as human beings so this was a great problem that humanity incurred because of their denial of God and this problem has continued through the centuries we live in a world today the secular world that we live in today the godless environment that we're a part of today has causing the same fundamental problems. We still cannot find the answers and we will not find the answers to these fundamental questions in the absence of God. And the, the irony is that as human beings, it's a part of our very nature to seek out these answers, to look for these answers. And when we can't find them, it causes, as it did in Hume, deep anxiety, distress, depression. So the problem has continued, but over the centuries, we've also continued to manufacture patches to 
distract us from the, this issue, these problems, these questions. Just as, you know, taking a leaf out of, I guess, Hume's book, which was whatever distracts you, if it's socialization, spending time with friends, enjoying whatever you enjoy, do that, engage in that. We have, over the years, developed newer and newer ways of distracting ourselves and deluding ourselves and keeping ourselves sort of plugged into this system so that we don't have to face these questions. But nevertheless, these questions still pop up in our minds every so often and leave us absolutely baffled. And these questions will continue to emerge in the future. They're not going to go anywhere. Now we're moving into this, what some are referring to as the postmodern age, you know, an age where everything is up in the air. There is no truth. Everything is up for interpretation. And everything has an infinite number of interpretations. You can choose to believe in things or believe things in the way you want to believe in them. And you don't even have to believe in anything if you don't want to believe in anything. This is the age we're moving towards now and I can see this problem just getting worse. Because, like I said, it's a part of our nature to seek out these answers, but we're never going to find these answers. This reminds me of a profound verse in the Qur'an where God warns us in a way of this reality. Where God says, وَلَا تَكُونُ كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِكُونَ That do not be like those who forgot God. And the word nasiyah here is very interesting because it's not, a, it's not a, an innocent forgetting. The type of, you know, where you, where you forget something just, just innocently without inten intention. You just forget about it because it's not important. Nasya here specifically refers to the type of forgetting where it's a deliberate type of forgetting, where you deliberately are turning away from something you know. And God is telling us, do not or do not be like those who forgot God in such a manner, and therefore God made them forget themselves. Those are the ones who are the true transgressors. It's a profound worse. It's almost a type of uh, if, I mean, look, put it this way, if you want an exegesis, a real world exegesis, a commentary on this verse, look at the period from the Enlightenment all the way up to today. It will blow your mind. And this is the reality of what, what we see. As soon as they turned away from God, they lost the bear their own bearings in regards to who they were, who we are, why we are. And this was a big problem and it's a problem we continue to face and we will continue to face. So I guess what I want to wrap up on is this is to first realize, and history is testament to this, that we will not find the answers to our most fundamental questions as human beings in the absence of God. It's not going to happen. We will never find them. So we have to start now inquiring or make a decision, well, are these questions really important to us? And I would argue because they are, because they are a part of our very nature as human beings, we can't run away from them. They must surely be important. And if they are important, well, are they worth going in pursuit of? And if they're worth going in pursuit of, well, then you start have, we have to start opening our minds, reopening our minds back up to worlds and realities beyond, you know, a world that's suggested through the lens of empiricism and scientism and, and naturalism. You know, we have to open our minds to the fact that there are, there may very possibly be worlds beyond this world, that realities and things beyond this world. And, and we have to realize that there was a point in history where our minds were deliberately pigeonholed from this perspective. We were taught and we still are taught to th see things from a very narrow perspective. Seeing is believing. You know, what's, what's observable is real. The empiricist way of looking at things. And we have to move beyond this. The humans throughout history have understood this. And, and humans throughout history have acknowledged a higher power, a creator, a being. Because it's a part of our very nature. It's a part of our fitrah, as is referred to in Islam. And, and I guess once we've moved past that barrier, is to next start to look into, well, okay, if there is something beyond this world, if there is a creator, who is he? You know, and if he exists, what has he given us? What has he sent us? And this is where I really encourage you guys to start looking into different religions, but in more specific, look into Islam. Because something unique about Islam, something that, that, that you will find absolutely fascinating, is that Islam doesn't suffer from the same problems as Christianity did, historically speaking. Some of the issues and problems which led, you can argue, to the Enlightenment. Islam doesn't suffer from the same problems. Islam doesn't tell you to turn away from the world, don't do the science. It doesn't tell you to become hermits or become monks or you know, uh, run away from any type of progress. No, Islam encourages these things. 
but first and foremost puts things into balance, into perspective, reminds humanity of who they are, why they are. And then from that perspective tells us, gives us the right moral and existential foundations and framework to, to move forward in this world. So I would really encourage people to look into Islam as I really believe after doing the research that I've done and I've looked into this to whatever extent I've looked into, that Islam is the solution for people in the future, for humanity in the future. But people have to wake up and also have to sort of shake off the misconceptions and distortions that are sold to them and told to them uh, you know, by popular media, you know, online atheist evangelists, uh, aggressive Christian missionaries, whatever the case may be. And to really look into Islam, the true Islam, and see what it says to you. And I encourage you to pick up the Qur'an. That's a good starting point. Pick up a good translation of the Qur'an and read it for yourself and see what it has to say. And leave you guys with this. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Till next time, take care.